All right, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm gonna take you back to 1982 for a moment. So I had just, I had basically come from Trinidad. I was born in Brooklyn, raised in Trinidad, um, in Brooklyn, and I, it's 1982, and Solid Gold is coming on. And I'm about seven years old. And this very, he was cute. He was cute, this artist comes out, his hair is to one side, and he sings Little Red Corvette, and he licks his fingers a lot. <laughs> and there's a part of me that's like, he's nasty, <laughs> but I'm not gonna look away. <laughs> and that was the first time I really remember seeing Prince. Not the first time hearing him, Prince, because I remember hearing I Wanna Be Your Lover. And as I'm sitting uh, through uh, this conference, and D'Angelo, this has been amazing, and I've sat through other symposiums in the past, there's this commitment around how do we become Prince literate? I'm um, gonna steal Zahir's words, right? And as an educator here in New York, uh, how literacy shows up, and whether it's in the form of books, or whether it's in the form of art or movement, we want, we want to make sure that we're educating not only the folks who are in the room, because I'm convinced that everybody sitting here has bought wholly and solely into prints, right? Some of you have that solid goal memory, just like I do. But in making sure that as we move forward with his work, we are able to enroll others in this prints literacy world, everything from the Afro, uh, futuristic pieces, I thought about, um, about Octavia Butler as you were sharing out, um, and the idea of how class and economics show up in characterization, and uh, considering the rock and roll impact and where Prince at times has not really been given the credit. I think about when, when Arthur was sharing, I thought about Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top talking about Prince and not acknowledge, he, he acknowledged that he did not take Prince seriously at all as a guitarist initially. And it wasn't probably until like close to Prince's passing that he really understood who Prince was as rock and roll. Yet we had Paul Bo Guzman in the early 80s after the Ritz performance acknowledging that. And of course, to the box set piece, right? The idea that how box sets, I love the piece uh, Michael talked about in terms of rewriting history. So I wanted to give all of our presenters the opportunity to think about what has been in within like with 1999 being our anchor. How did that album help you within your Prince literacy? So D'Angelo began the last round table about the favorite song on the album. I'm curious about like, if you were to tell somebody, here's 1999, and you can take it back to 1982 when you got the album. I didn't get the album until I was 13 because my mother said, no way. And the first thing I learned was how to spell whore. I was like, oh, it has a W. <laughs> got it, right? So like, I get it. I was like, wow, that's helpful. Okay, right, so I didn't get, I didn't get 1999 in hand until I was 13. So wherever you were in 1982, and you're able, to, you're able to access 1999. Could you talk about the track on the album that you really believe, you know what, you hear this and you become Prince literate. You get a window into who Prince is, it's comprehensive and it speaks to who he is as an artist at that time. And whoever would like to start. I'll start, is this on? I have a, yes, I have a rep. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I got you, Arthur. I got your mic. You if, know, you, if it goes out, on you. <laughs> back me up. Uh, automatic. So opens up the the two records. Opens up side three. Um, automatic. I mean, uh, for me, when I when I recommend 1999 uh, to people, um, I call out automatic because there's so many components of Prince in that song. You have this electronic component. I, I mean, I really look at Prince as an electronic artist, which is kind of ironic because 1999 is kind of like his only real like electronic album if you think about it. There are other components to it, but even Controversy had acoustic drums. Uh, 1999, not so much. I just think one, no more than two songs. Um, but that to say, you have a guitar solo toward the end. You have um, background vocals. And um, it's nervous to talk about things <laughs> when you have people in the room that are actually sort of there, like, uh-uh, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Especially Miss Jones, who'd be like, no. Yeah. No. But, um, <laughs> but, um, but, but the fact that, that she's there, you hear her um, 
voice and vocal, who, and, and, and really for me, you know, when it got to be where songs by Prince, particularly in his classic period going into 1989, 1990, and you didn't hear Jill Jones background vocals, you thought something was missing from that song. Um, the, uh, I think I already mentioned the Lynn, um, and, and, and the narrative, the, the, the idea that here I am, you know, like for me in my, what, 12 year old eyes, you know, here I am Prince, who I think is like, I just wanna be that guy, you know, talking about, I'm a fool for you. I, you have control, you know, please don't break my heart. He's the, very vulnerable. Even in even in what otherwise has kind of an aggressive mm -hmm. song, right. you know, mm -hmm. um, that kind of uh, lyricism uh, absent from the video. The video the video kind of did weird me out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get there. But absent of the video, yeah, <laughs> automatic automatic all day. Yeah, I'd say. Uh, the use of technology, particularly on Little Red Corvette, had a uh, big impact on me. But the, the intro is very spare, the use of the synthesizer, the drum machine programming, uh, the very haunting ambience of the track. For a uh, contemporary black artist in 1982, 83, to be heard in that context was very unusual. And then, of course, we got to the guitar, uh, which over time has actually taken on greater proportions, I'd say. So that was, I mean, a couple of years before that, a friend of mine came rushing by and said, you've got to hear this track. He was talking about Bambi, you know, because of the guitar work. Mm -hmm. And so I had to take Prince seriously as a guitarist from that time onwards. But this was a different phase. It was a kind of uh, artistic maturity in process. And for me, it became really evident with a little record there. Robert, did you want to go or Christy? Well, I was, I mean, I was um, eight when, nine, when 1989 came out. So like I was saying, like I didn't see, or he, I'm sure I heard it on a radio. I'm sure I probably heard 1999, but I didn't see a video until it was a couple years after that. Um, I didn't have this, like the album on cassette or CD um until i want to guess like probably i don't know 88 or something but anyway so i was a little bit older when i was like fully engaging in it um and i would say that little red corvette i think stuck with me because it was so different um as a pop song it was doing things that just were very different from other pop songs uh pop in a very broad sense of the term um and so yeah i i think that probably was the one that was stuck with me the most yes same for me absolutely I was a child of MTV I was obsessed with MTV and just to see you know just to see that beautiful man in that way I was just obsessed with his aesthetic and the yeah for me the visual aesthetic was just just so um, staggering I've never seen anything like it so for me that was the the hook completely the visuals uh, I mean I you know literary Corvette the Prince there's some songs where he's just like, no one does an opening line like that. You know, I guess you should have known. I guess I should have known by the way you parked your car. But um, I guess I'm thinking about your question differently than like what m like made have drawn me to Prince and more to this question of literacy. Um, and so I'm interested in the songs that have us looking out um, that breaks the hermetic seal that we put Prince in. Um, because he is a kind of one of a kind artist, there's a tendency to see him like uh, of his own doing and of his own making and this like he's in this bubble that is not part of a historical trajectory that is not part of other communities. And so the, you know, 1999 speaks to a world bigger than Prince. Um, but I think sonically something in the water um, is like probably one of the coldest mm -hmm. songs he's right. produced. Right. Uh, especially when you hear the original, right? Like that's much warmer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that situates the album in the 
Cold War in the noir kind of um, vibe that that he's it, it's lonely. Mm -hmm. It's it's the it's everything that you know people who were afraid of the apocalypse were feeling and during that period. Um, and so I think that that track invites us to think about the world in which Prince was creating um, and, and the ways he was responding to it. Because I don't, I don't think he gets credit as a thinker, um, as an intellectual, um, someone who is reflecting on the world that he is in. I, I, you know, hands down musician, uh, but I don't think people like think about him as a person with ideas. Um, because I think his ideas are often dismissed as a kind of pop kitsch. Um, and as a result, like his, his value as a thinker is not appreciated. So I would lean into those songs that, that actually require you to lean in um, as opposed to just kind of like, oh, that was you know, like a passive experience. It must be something in the order would have been my choice as well. Um, it's dark, it's sexy, but it's also, to our word, Robert, it's vulnerable, mm -hmm. right? And I think that I agree with you, right? The idea that Prince is not always celebrated in the highest light. I don't think he really gets a lot of credit. I think he's known in like critical circles for it, but then when it comes to normalizing it, like this is what Prince is known for. So MTV's come up. So one of my questions was around, and uh, Michael and, and is Kirstie, right? I'm saying correctly? And Kirsty, they in their in their presentation, they talked about the lack of the videos within the box set. Now, 1999 is the first video of Prince's that is actually shown on MTV, and so it airs on MTV in December of '82, and then I would say spring, like an, of '83, David Bowie goes off on MTV about the lack of representation of Black artists on MTV. Around that time, Billie Jean uh, drops. Oh, is it Billie Jean would be the first? I can't I'm not a Michael fan that way. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but I do know that Little Red Corvette comes on around that time as well. So, <laughs> so the idea that you know Prince was one of the artists, one of the black artists who opened the door for how MTV engages black artists has never really been celebrated. And I think it is interesting that it's left out. So what's your commentary on that? And I can go to Michael and Kiersey around, like, in, like the thinking of the why, I guess, is my question. Like, it's such a, it is a pivotal piece. He doesn't get the credit for it, and he was one of the first. Maybe some of this comes back to Arthur's presentation about uh, historical erasure of black guitarists and their pivotal roles. And of course, it is very interesting the way that uh, Keith Richards is influenced by Muddy Waters and the Howling Wolf, and then Prince is opening for the Stones in 81. So there's a kind of historical circularity. Uh, but as for why, uh, well, there's also the reference to uh, this kind of uh, racial capitalism uh, and the way that that works within the recording industry. And it still continues to work exactly. in a lot of ways. So uh, I, I, I would have to say that's the why. Thank you for that. So I wanna, I'm going to go to... Uh, questions from the audience because we're looking at time here. So for Zaheer, can you discuss Prince's rejection of categories in the context of Afrofuturism, particularly as a way of avoiding capture? And that's from Jessica. Uh, yeah, I think that, um, I mean, that, that's what he does. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that's the do, know, right. So there is this, um, you know, so there's this, this thing of within the context of this framework of like what is fungible um, and what is non, not fungible. I'm not talking about NFTs. Yeah. Um, sure, Prince would have had lots of I opinions about that. Wonder why you were going that. with that. Yeah. Um, but this, the fungibility, right, which is like the disposability of black life that is part of the technology of racism and how it evolves in, you know, in the United States, um, where race is the science fiction, right? It is, it is presented as science, but it's fictional but it doesn't mean it doesn't have impact, right? Um, and so in order to evade that capture, Prince does play with racial categories, right? We've talked about he does a kind of passing 
um, you know, shifting how he's being identified. Um, but he's also trying to embrace a blackness that is expansive, or not embrace, but share a blackness that is expansive. You know, there's a famous story where he says to the marketing people at Warner Brothers, don't market me as a black artist. And, and many people have interpreted that as, as Prince saying, I don't want to be black. Um, you know, that's like uh, County Cullen saying, like, I, I don't want to be a Negro poet, I just want to be a poet. And people are like, oh, he don't want to be black. What they don't want to be is your limited, narrow definition of black because that limited, narrow definition of black is why you couldn't find him in that record store under P, right? right. right? Um, and so that, I think, is the, the dissembling, right? Like, dissembling is like a euphemism for lying. Right. But like, that's the dissembling <laughs> that, that Prince does, right? And that's part of the, you know, the, the part of with, within the tradition of Afrofuturism is like, you know, how do you, like, navigate a, um, the, the, me the mechanics of racism, which is institutional and structural, and has like a very strict logic, right? You get in this section or you get in that section. I mean, that's segregation, right? So how do you navigate that? Well, you say like, I'm not gonna play that game. I'm not gonna be either of those things. I mean, in a sense, Vanity Six, the time in prints, that triple threat is, is his decoding and recombining codes of race and gender. Um, by splitting it into his music into three separate acts, but but not in ways that we would like, you know, in ways that dis disrupt like what we think femininity is by what we think um, blackness or black manhood is, and finally what we think of Prince, right? So like that's his like messing with the code. He's like hacking the code of race and class and gender with the triple threat. Thank you for that. Uh, so, um, Arthur, I'm going to go uh, to you. So someone uh, posed the question. You asked the question about if, if Des was around, what we have gotten. If, he's, if, so he if you had stayed around. So That's I, a very Afrofuturist question. It is. <laughs> yes, it is. It, it tied beautifully in. So I guess I'm curious about, like, so to what Zahir was just sharing, with Des, after we, after we do, because my cousin my cousin's in the audience, and I'm thinking about Rachel's the reason why I, I'm sitting here. Um, yeah, I love you too. So I'm, I'm thinking about, so within Purple Rain, we get Mod and Air. We get a clip of Mod and Air. It takes me years to actually hear the whole song, <laughs> right? Is, is, is Dez, how, like why, why don't we get to hear more from Dez? Like, what is, like in how the industry works, very talented guitarist. And then after this moment in time, like he's, when he's referred to often, it's around how he showed up between 1981 to uh, 1999 and 1983, right around that for that for that release, what's what's what do you think is the holdup? Is it is it this is it the racism around how guitarists are treated well, within, or the the perception, or you can't get past this point for the X factor? Well, building a little bit off of what Zahir was saying about the lens in which um, uh, gatekeepers view black music. I, I said in my presentation that Dez was, is, and would ever, forever be a rock guy. Right. When, he, when he left, he opened up for Billy Idol. Um, Billy Idol's guitarist, Steve Stevens, was a fan of Dez Dickerson. Um, was very likely instrumental in getting him you know, on the tour slot. And it, so I think that I think that because Des wasn't going to do Prince music after leaving Prince's band, it created a bit of a pigeonhole situation. And the, bil the, the Billy Idol piece happened with, with the, in like the 83, 84? Right, right, right. I believe it was the, the, the Rebel Yell tour. And I, I think just based off of personal decisions and you know deals not going through, um, Des decided to, you know, move on and, you know, and do other things, and he's still involved in the music industry. Yeah. Thank you for that, and thank you for bringing Des alive in a different Listen, way, I'm like awakening <laughs> the Des factor. Because yeah, he was I'm a so bit of a you know, Des stan, and um, it was through Des that I kind of did some reverse engineering of my own through 1999, um, and even even when 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 talking about 
automatic, and then I'll stop because I can kind of be a long talker. You, something about automatic is that there's a history of Detroit techno in that song. There's a history of Detroit techno in Prince in, as an artist, but that album in, you know, specifically. So, um, and even though Des isn't involved in it, it's still my favorite song in the album. I, I just think that, I think that Des Dickerson is uh, an unsung hero, if you will. Received. Okay, so uh, two more questions, D'Angelo, all right. So uh, for Robert, I know you, you, were, you wanted to talk a little bit more about Lady Cab Driver. So as you were presenting, I was thinking about, and this is always a risk, because she's at the back of the room, right? Yeah. So <laughs> hearing Lady Cab Driver and, and hearing, uh, I remember coming into my teenage years and as a girl and growing into womanhood, right? I hear that, and there's a part of me that's like, I get to have an orgasm. Mm. Right? Yeah. I get, and this is, I think, when, hmm. <laughs> when D'Angelo was talking in the last one with I'm, I Don't Want to Leave You as your track. I think women at times, we he, when we hear Prince, we can hear the nuance in the music, we can hear the, the, um, the, the message that he's bringing forth. And then there's always this sexual aspect that he contributes. And I, I, I wonder often how men hear that differently than women do. Yeah. Um, and in Lady Cab Driver, is this, you know, this, this, you know, take me to your mansion, honey, let's go everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this promise of who I get to be as the man in your world, and then it ends with, you know, this is for the, this is for the, this is for the, and then he goes right. through, so for every stroke, or for every, you know, there's no children in the room, right? For every stroke, for every, every scream, there is mm -hmm. a reason that you're getting this. Yeah. So as a young female listener, I was like, word, take notes. And like it took, <laughs> it took, yeah. It's like I'm very like I'm very demanding in that category. Like you gotta land the plane, brother, right? <laughs> Just saying. So you bring <laughs> you bring this, you yeah. ladies. Right? Am I wrong? Oh, okay. I just wanna make sure. Just checking. Just 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 checking, right? So I'm just curious, like you know, <laughs> with 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 what you're bringing around class, culture, economics, right? Um, and and not so much mentioning of the sex part, right? Uh, I skimmed over some. Okay. So I want to just give you an opportunity to, to help close that bridge, because that definitely was on my mind as no, you were speaking. I think, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. And for, I want to say Jill's been really gracious about uh, all of this, I think, you know, from, uh, from, the, from not just here at the conference, but I think on Twitter and stuff, too. Um, no, I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's the danger of, quite frankly, just like men being the ones that are giving critical opinions all the damn time. And, you know, we need to have... Uh, women speaking up. I will say too that as when I was a little older, then I I heard the same. Let's call it just attention to detail that that you were just describing. In that, like as a young heterosexual male, to understand that that you know uh, <laughs> providing pleasure is important, right? Uh, and so that that I think one of the things that men um, look to Prince for. Um, is to understand like a different way of being masculine and um, you know from my perspective that's something that I always connected with with Prince from the very beginning um, so yeah that's about the best I got but I think yeah no I think you know what you're saying makes total sense thank yeah. you and one last question uh, to Kirsty and to Michael the idea that uh, the vanity six and the what time is it was not a part of the box um, set. So there's a question here about that. Thinking on that, and was that a missed opportunity from the estate? I guess I don't know. It's so difficult, isn't it? That we're trying to project what you know, what they're actually thinking, and the creative decisions that they're making. Uh, it's so hard to know. You know, um, we got what we got, and we love it. But there's so much more, and we know. We just hope that there's going to be some great stuff that comes through next. But yeah, those decisions sometimes uh, they're curious and. They don't always make sense to me, and I know they don't make sense to you either, Mike, but we got what we got. All right. Thank you so much, and hopefully within the next couple of box sets, they do rewrite history. Exactly. And then create more inclusive. Thank you so much to this awesome panel. Thank you. You're fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much, and my answer to that question is yes. It was a missed opportunity. <laughs> because Vanity Six is out of print, um, and that is a travesty. All right. 
So I hope you enjoyed the day. Yeah. We are at the end of it. And um, I want to talk about what we're going to do tomorrow with the quickness. I want to remind everybody that we're not going to be here at 10. So if you come here, again, look at the schedule at a glance, not at 370 J Street. Um, it's going to be, actually, this virtual session is going to be on YouTube, but I'm going to embed it on the homepage. So if you just go to the homepage of the Triple Threat Symposium website, you'll be able to find it. But if you already know where I am on YouTube, you can find it there as well. And so we're going to have our, um, our second album pr of presentations about 1999 virtually from Edgar Krauser, Ka um, Cassie Ritchie, Adam Rudiger, and Camila Cummings. And we're going to have Monroe France moderate. And I'm very happy about that because he just left NYU. He's transitioning to a new position. And he still said, I will still be there. And I was like, OK. And then we are going to open the doors tomorrow here. We're going to be back here tomorrow at 1 p.m. And we're going to do the welcome at 1.30 p.m. And for me personally, I think this is a do not miss presentation. If you care about the LM1 and the Lindrum, uh, we have Dan Charnas in the house doing a presentation called Human Time, Machine Time, Prince in the LM1. And then at 3.15, 445, we talked about this powerhouse of a 1999 Alba Roundtable. This is also a Do Not Miss Roundtable. And then tomorrow, our final, final, final session will come back around to Kirsty and Mike with a 1999 Super Deluxe Roundtable. And um, you should know these folks. We talked about them earlier today from 5 to 6.30 p.m. And then it's going to be a wrap. It went by so fast. So I hope that you enjoyed the day. I hope you get some rest and see you tomorrow.